prophets proclaimed his deity. The miracles told the power of his touch. The basin and the towel proved his humility. But to show the depths of his matchless love for us, it took the cross. It took that. To set us free With his heart broken Arms wide open His blood called to the lost To pay sin's final cost It took the cross The teachings in the temple Displayed his worthiness the tears he shed in sorrow spoke his heart. The children in his arms revealed his tenderness. But for his saving grace to reach us where we are, it, it took the cross, it took that rugged tree to show just how far he'd go. To set us free with his heart broken, arms wide open, his blood called to the lost, to pay sin's final cost, it took the cross. The message of mercy, once for all proclaimed, through his sacrifice, what a price he paid. Trio, appreciate that. Well, I heard a lot of good conversations around campus yesterday about the message in chapel, and I appreciate that. I'm glad that when we hear a message, we don't just leave it in the chapel, but take it with us and have some conversation about it and talk about it in the dormitories and how God spoke to our heart. It's one thing to come forward and make a decision with the Lord. It's another thing to, to flesh that out in our life and live it out and, and talk to others about it and see how it applied to them. And boy, that was a tremendous message just about uh, coming back to that, that, that place where God can work in our heart. And coupled with Wednesday's message, being conformed to the image of Christ, what a tremendous set of messages we have already heard. And I'm looking forward to today. And thank you, Pastor Delaney, for spending these two days with us. Uh, these pastors that come, they have busy ministries back where they are. And uh, I know it's a sacrifice for them to spend time with us, but I'm so glad they do. And it gives us a chance to hear their heart and uh, let God speak through them to us. And uh, I'm so excited about what we're going to hear today. So, Brother Delaney, you come. Let's welcome him back to chapel for this day today. Thank you, Dr. Dutch. All right, take your Bibles and go with me to Titus. Stay standing. Titus, chapter number one, the book of Titus in chapter number one. And we're going to be, uh, or rather, Titus chapter number two, I'm sorry, then it's going to be verse number six. Titus chapter two, verse number six. And then once again, let me just extend uh, uh, my appreciation to uh, Dr. Getch and Dr. Rasmussen for allowing me to be here, faculty and staff as well. I certainly admire what's happening here at West Coast Baptist College. I uh, am thrilled to watch it from afar and be a partner of it and with it. And uh, I feel a little overdressed. But I, I concur with Dr. Getch. You guys look pretty sharp in the, uh, in the West Coast gear. I like it. And I'll have to stop by the bookstore on the way out and pick up some of my own and then wear the West Coast gear on Sunday when I preach at my <laughs> church in Long Island. Right, Titus chapter number two. 
Titus chapter 2. Look at verse 1. But speak thou the things which become sound doctrine. Is this, this is the instruction. We talked yesterday, the instruction, the warning given to us. Speak thou the things which become sound doctrine. And then he lays out an order of what that would look like for different groups of people. Aged men, verse 2. Aged women, verse 3. Young women, verse 4, verse 5, verse 6. Young men, verse 9 and 10. Servants, masters. He's saying, speak the things that become sound doctrine. And if you're in this aged men category, here's what it would look like. And if you're in this, here's what it would look like. If you're in the young man category, this is what it would look like for you in order to speak the things that become sound doctrine. And then underlying all of that, verse 11, for the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared unto all men teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, that we should live soberly and righteously and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and that glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. These things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority and let no man despise thee. So we said yesterday, we're going to go strong after Christ. We're going to see him high and holy and lifted up, and we're going to press on into him, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth under those things which are before us. So what, what does that mean then? What does it mean to go strong after Christ? What does it mean to press on into him, to see him big and high and holy, to magnify him. What would that look like? What does that look like? What does it look like to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength? Well, if, if I told you I love my wife Amanda with everything that I have, and you say, well, that's, that's sweet, that's wonderful. Tell me something about your wife. How tall is she? And I said, well, and I don't really know how tall she is, like approximately right here. Somewhere between four foot and 6'10". She's in between. <laughs> if, if I said, I love my wife, and you said, okay, well, well, tell me what are the colors of her eyes? I don't, I don't really know what her eye color is. It may, maybe, maybe it's blue, maybe it's, maybe it's brown, maybe it's green. I, 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 maybe it's like red. I, I mean, I don't, I don't know. I, I'm, not, I'm not into all that stuff. I'm not, I'm not into all those little details. I just, I just love my wife. You say, well what, well, what are her hobbies? What are her interests? What things does she enjoy to do with her free time? What, and I, I'm not into all this minutia about all these little details. You know, I don't really feel like getting bogged down in all that. I just love my wife. You would really start to wonder if I could even pick my wife out in a crowd. <laughs> and so it is when we use language like, well, I'm not into all these rules and I'm not into all this you know, obedience and I'm not into all this holiness and I'm not into all this godliness and I'm not into, I just want Jesus. You see, that sounds really spiritual until you kind of push on it a little bit. And then you push on that a little bit and you say, well, tell me something about him. Well, tell me what his heart beats. Tell me what his eyes see. Tell me where his hands reach. Tell me something about him if you love him like that. 
You see, you can't have Jesus and have him mean something to you unless you know some propositions about him and unless you go after him and his word, submitting yourself to obey it. Be careful that you are not a hearer of the word only, deceiving yourself, thinking that the truth is in you. No, brothers, no, sisters. Hey, let's not be hearers only, but be doers of the word also. Lest you deceive yourself, thinking that the truth is in you, but it isn't. What would that look like then for us as young men, as young ladies? What would that look like? What it look like to go strong after the Lord? And Titus gives us that instruction. We'll take it. Our time's short this morning, so we'll take it as quickly as we can. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for today. Father, give us eyes to see. Give us ears to hear what the Spirit saith to us. And lead us in the path of holiness and obedience for your name's sake. That men may see our good works and glorify our Father which is in heaven. And that many may come to a saving knowledge of you through, because, the testimony that we live out before them. And in Jesus' name we pray, and all the church said together, Amen. Amen. Thank you for standing. May be seated. Paul is making the same point that we emphasized yesterday. God is a speaking and saving God. God has revealed himself to us in his word, and God is redeeming us to himself by his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. That's understood in verse number 11. For the grace of God, hath, for the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared unto all men. That phrase ties back to verse number 10 at the end of that verse that reads, that they may adorn the doctrine of God, our Savior, in all things. That God, through Jesus, is in the business of saving people. God, through Jesus, is in the business of bringing people back into relationship with him. And because he is a saving, speaking God, because he is a revealing, redeeming God, and his grace has appeared to us, therefore, verse 12, therefore, his grace is teaching us to deny all ungodliness and worldly lust that we should live soberly, righteously, and godly, notice the phrase, in this present world. You should mark that phrase, in this present world. That phrase, in this present world, is a direct tie to what Paul has already admonished Timothy about in chapter number one. He's speaking to the world of the Cretans. This is where Timothy was pastoring there in Crete. And he's already said about those that are in Crete, in chapter one, verse number 12, that one of themselves, even a prophet of their own, said the Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, slow bellies. This witness is true. So therefore, or wherefore, rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in the faith. And so he pulls, Tim, he pulls Titus rather into this. Look at verse number 16 of chapter 1. This is where he ends. They profess that they know God, but in works they deny him being abominable and disobedient and unto every good work reprobate. So Paul is saying, Timothy or Titus, this is our God-given assignment to reach the lost. This is our God-given assignment to proclaim Christ. This is our God-given assignment to cause Christ to be high and lifted up so that he might draw all men to himself. And he's saying, Titus, there is a way in which you use your words, you preach sound doctrine as a way to draw men men to Christ. Verse 1, speak thou the things which become sound doctrine. But he doesn't end there. 
He doesn't say, now only message sound doctrine. He doesn't say only message the, the, the message of Christ. Only message it. He says, to, he says, Titus, it is important that you message Christ, that you preach him and you hold him up and you esteem him and you preach him to be great and big and strong and redeeming and saving and loving and compassionate. Preach Christ that way. But Titus, live it as well. Preach Christ, but also live it. So that's what he moves down to verse number two. The aged man, be sober, grave, temperate, sound in doctrine, in charity, and in patience. He tells the older man, have love, have patience. Why? Because the older you get, the grumpier you become. So he's saying, be careful that you don't just, in your age, just become grumpy and cranky, but be filled with love. Why? Because you preach Christ, who is full of love for all men everywhere. So see to it that you walk that way as well. He gives the instructions to aged women. He gives the instruction to young women. Then verse number six, hey, young men, likewise exhort to be sober-minded. It's the exhortation to young men from Paul. Be sober-minded. The word sober-minded means be self-controlled. And if you're not careful, you look at this list and you go, really, that's it? That's all the instruction for young men? Look at how much instruction the aged men get. Look at how much instruction the aged women get. Look at how much instruction the young women get. They get two verses. And look at verse number six. Young men, be sober-minded. Possess self-control. Paul is zeroing in on this singular virtue for young men. Because this singular virtue for young men is something that young men aspire to the least. Being sensible, being disciplined, being self-controlled is not, it's not a virtue that our culture prizes. It's not a culture, it's not a virtue that our culture lifts up and says, we want young men sensible. Our culture prizes be young and wild and free and live it up and enjoy all you can while you have the energy to enjoy it. And just do what you want, when you want, with whoever you want, however you want, and just live to yourself while you have the time. So Paul is zeroing in on this and he's saying, young men, That although culture may not prize being sober-minded and disciplined and sensible and self-controlled, you that are godly should prize this. You should hold to this. You should esteem this. ESPN, entertainment, and sports. This is what we love. They never say, and now... In the news of self-controlled world of athletics. They never say that. They always make it the biggest. They always make it the best. They always make it the most extreme. The most crazy. The most ridiculous. The most outrageous. We don't push in the direction of self-control. Going after Jesus as a young man means harnessing that energy, harnessing that enthusiasm in order that you may fight the good fight, in order that you may run the race, in order that you may endure suffering and affliction, in order that you might bring your body into subjection, in order that you might be a good soldier. Young men must have self mastery self-control, good sense of balance and direction. Young men should exhibit self-control over their power, over their appetites, over their facilities in order that we might reach the lost. That's what he's saying. This is his goal. 
Not so we can show ourselves better, but that we might show Christ to be great and to be high and to be worthy. Is Christ worthy? That is the question that he lays at the feet of young men. Is he worthy of your appetite? Is he worthy of that passion? Is he worthy of that enthusiasm? Then lay it down for Christ and go strong after him. Hear me on this, because this is the warning. Paul is an observer of the culture. You'll notice verse number 12 of chapter number 1. Even one of their own poets say, Paul is an observer of the culture. We ought to observe the culture. Paul is not arguing to be an enemy of the culture. He's not saying be unnecessarily offensive to the culture. He's not saying you should be ignorant of the culture. Bury your head in the sand and pretend like the culture around us does not exist. Listen, we should be objective observers of the culture, but there is a difference between being an objective observer of the culture and being an indiscriminate consumer of that culture. I'll say it again so you can write it down. It'll help you later. There is a difference between being an objective observer of the culture and being an indiscriminate consumer of that very same culture. And Paul is saying, young men, I exhort you to self-control, that you do not find yourselves just being consumers of the culture that you are in, just consuming. No, 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 no. Practice self-discipline. Be sober-minded. The world would have us to live our lives for trivial things. The world would have us to live our lives for things that will not matter in eternity. The world would have us to live our lives for the here, for the now. And God's word calls us to a greater reality. And that greater reality is that there is an eternal destiny where we live for millions and millions and millions of years someplace other than right here. Do not live for this world. No, die to the things of this world and live for Christ while you can. Because there is an eternal weight of glory for those who suffer now. Today's my birthday. Thank you. That doesn't feel very sincere, but okay. 38 years old today. It's not that old, okay? It sounds old to you, but when you're on this side of it, it's not that old. I consider myself to still be young. My oldest sons, Gabe and Ethan, decided as for a joke and my aging that they would get me a subscription to Men's Health Journal. <laughs> said, Dad, we got you a birthday gift. I love gifts. I said, oh, this is awesome. What did you get me? I just thought it was maybe a LeBron James jersey, you know, some maybe some nice Nikes. I need a new pair of shoes. And I thought something fancy like that. They said, here you go, because you're getting older. You got to watch that health. Here you go. I said, is this a joke? Where's my real gift? They said, that is your real gift. Children. First page, of the art, first page of the magazine. 40 things you must have before you're 50. <laughs> really? Must have? Got to check that out. The only thing in there that was even remotely interesting was this like really fancy blender. I kind of wanted that. <laughs> I mean, it's all this is this truck and this house and this vacation, this place you have to go and these these luxuries and entertainments that you have to enjoy before you get 50 because you hit 50 and it's just. (laughs) (laughs) 
I'm gonna move over to this side. <laughs> Weigh that in light of the scripture. Now you can lay up for yourselves treasures on the earth where moth and rust doth corrupt, where thieves break through and steal. You can do that. Or you can lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt and where thieves do not break through and steal. Choose for yourself, but make a wise and worthy investment. Choose for yourself, but make a wise and worthy investment. There is a way that you can spend your life for the here and for the now, and you'll enjoy it, and it'll be fun, and you'll get all the things you're supposed to get before you turn 50, but you'll lose it all in eternity. I don't want to be buried with a blender, do you? <laughs> this guy had the nicest blender on the block. I don't, I don't want to be that guy. But there is a world full of young adults who think that that is the way that we should spend our living. There is a world full of people in our generation who think that this is the pursuit of life, to get the fanciest gadgets, to get the fanciest gizmos, to have it all here right now. Listen, live for something so much greater than this life. Spend your living for there, not for here. Invest your life for eternity, not for now. And that will not happen. You cannot do that. You will not do that. If you just consume the culture around you, you must be able to pull back from that. And you must be able to think carefully and think soberly and think with eternity's view in your mind. You see why it's so important to exhort young men to be sober-minded? Because all the world around us is pulling us into this. No, no, no. Get serious later. No, no, no. Live for Jesus later. You're only 21 once. Exactly. As a pastor, I have the unfortunate privilege of walking into people's pain. I don't know how many funerals I've done. This will, this will be my 10th year as being a pastor. I don't know how many funerals I've done in 10 years, but I can tell you this. I've done far more funerals for people under the age of 75 than I have for people over the age of 75. I've done far more funerals for people who thought, I'll get serious about Jesus later. I'm just going to live for myself right now. Your promise tomorrow in Jesus is coming soon. Eternity is closer than you think it is. This life, it's a vapor. It's here for a little time. And then it's God. Live for God. Give him everything you have. Give him all of your strength and all of your energy and all of your enthusiasm and all of your love and all of your heart while you can. Amen. Exhort young men to be sober-minded. Notice the example that Titus is supposed to be. I gotta go quick. So the verse six is the exhortation to young men. Verse seven and verse eight is the exhortation to Titus on how to be that example for young men. In all things, showing thyself a pattern of good works. In doctrine, showing uncorruptness, gravity, sincerity, sound speech that cannot be condemned. That he, that is of contrary part, may be ashamed, having no evil thing to say of you. So Titus is to be an example to these young men who he is supposed to be exhorting to be self-controlled and sober-minded. He's to be an example of that, and he's to be an example of that in these ways. Namely, a pattern of good works, and then doctrine. It's interesting how you can take the whole of what Titus is supposed to be, and you can summarize it into two things. Watch your doctrine and watch your life. Watch your doctrine and watch your deeds. Keep a close watch on what you're teaching and what you're preaching, and keep a close watch on how you're living 
and the things you're doing and the entertainments you're enjoying. Keep a close watch on these things, Titus. And in so doing, you will be a pattern of good works. You see that phrase? Pattern of good works? Literally means be an example, be a pattern of what someone can look to and come after. Paul has used this expression already in his writings. Titus is meant to be a pattern the same way in which Paul was a pattern. Being a pattern, being an example, does not mean that Titus is supposed to be perfect. There are no perfect people, not even you. There are no perfect people, not even me. There are no perfect people, not even pastors, not even teachers. So they're not to be perfect people. They're not to be sinless. There are no sinless pastors. There are no sinless teachers. And yet, we are still to be examples. That although we may not be perfect, and although we may not be sinless, we are still to be examples. Paul even said this, follow me as I follow Christ. Follow me as I follow Christ. I'll, I'll example or model or pattern for you how to go strong after Christ. And in so doing, Paul admonishes us, follow me. But Paul does not say, be ye holy as I am holy. There's only one person who can say that, and that was God. Paul's exhortation isn't be holy because I'm holy. Paul's exhortation is follow me because I'm following Jesus. And we want you to be like Jesus. So follow Jesus. He'd already admitted in Philippians that he had not already apprehended. Paul has admitted he's weak in the flesh. Paul has admitted that he's a sinful man. In fact, he's not just a sinful man. He's the chief of sinners. He's the best sinner of them all. That's what it means. I'm the chief of sinners. And yet, follow me as I follow Christ. Be an example. We're adverse to this in our culture. I don't know why. We're adverse to this when godly, holy, righteous men stand and say, follow me as I follow Jesus. For some reason, we take that to mean that they are making perfection, professions of perfection. And they aren't. What they're saying is, we want to see Christ in you. We want to see you live for a greater reality, and that is eternity. What they're saying is, we see something in you that could far outlast this life, and you can live for something greater than yourselves, or you can choose to just live for yourself. And they're pulling us this way. They're exhorting us this way. This is a, this is a side note. We should be thankful that we have godly leaders who serve us as examples so that we can go strong after Christ. It should also serve us as a reminder that every pastor, every teacher should be an example to those who are come behind them of how to go after Christ. If someone's watching you in doctrine and in deed, are they seeing Jesus? If someone's watching you in doctrine and in deed, are they seeing Jesus? Paul's admonishment to Titus is simply that. He says, our goal is what we should want as ministers for people to see Jesus in us. And wouldn't it be great if we just woke up one morning and decided or discovered that all of our ungodliness, all of our unrighteousness, all of our imperfections and sins, if they were just somehow gone. So, so what, do we, what do we do between what we know in the mind and where we currently are in the heart? This is really the end of the passage. Okay, be, be sober-minded, be serious-minded, be self-controlled, bring yourself into control. What would it look like if I lived 
self-controlled with my lust? What would it look like if I lived with self-control in, in regards to my purity? What would it look like if I lived in self-control self in regards to my spirituality? What would it look like if I lived self-controlled life in regards to my education? What would it look like if I lived a self-controlled life in regards to my physical nature? What, what would it look like if I lived a self-controlled life in regards to my anger or my gossiping? Oh, this is a good one. What would it look like if I lived a self-controlled life in light of my social media accounts? What would self-control look like there? So how do we move from knowing that in our mind and feeling that in our heart? Because that can be a long distance, can't it? And here's what he says, verse 11. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, that we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, and looking for that blessed hope. The big question that I need you to answer is what do you do when your heart is not where your mind is? What do you do when what you know is sin, what you know is right, what you know is wrong, what you know you ought to be doing, what you know you ought not to be doing is in battle or conflict with what you are currently doing. This is one of the most ridiculous things to me. This is quite literally the definition of hypocrisy. Exhortation without example is hypocrisy. That we pretend like we have everyone fooled when in reality we have no one fooled. You have no one who matters fooled. You have no one who matters fooled. You may have your family fooled. You may have the teachers and, and, and faculty of West Coast fooled. Congratulations, you have these people fooled. You, you'll win an Oscar. Way to go. But do you know who you do not have fooled? The only one that matters. And that is God, your Father. Who you will one day stand in front of and give an account of all your life to. It's this recurring nightmare that people have, whether at school or at work, that they somehow have this dream or nightmare that all they do is show up in their underclothing. Anybody have that dream? Don't raise your hand. That'll tell us a lot about you. I don't really know what the underlying reasons are for that. You can talk to the folks in the college who are more intelligent than I am in that regard. But people wake up in a cold sweat with this fear. I showed up to the class in my underclothing, right? And they're, good, I'm still in my bed. And then they go back to sleep. Oh, watch your, what, what Paul is reminding Titus is you are living that dream. You are living that dream. You, you cannot keep secrets from God. And you will one day stand in front of the God who you have no secrets with. And you will answer for all you've done in this life. And that ought to move us then with this holy fear. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So what do we do in the meantime? Three things. i got to get out of here. Three things. There's present grace to pursue obedience and remember a promised glory. That's what he says in 11 to verse 14. Look, at, look. Stand under the waterfall of this present grace. That's what he says in verse 11. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared unto all men. It's the grace of God that leads us to repentance. It was the grace of God that allowed us to come to a saving knowledge of God. It's the grace of God that keeps us in his perfect will, leading us along the paths of life. And it's the grace of God that will take us all the way home one day to stand in front of Jesus. It's always been the grace of God. It will always be the grace of God. And the grace of God reigns over all of that in our lives. Stand under the waterfall of this present grace, but walk in the path of obedience. 
teaching us to deny ungodliness, teaching us to deny worldly lust, teaching us to live soberly and righteously in this present world. So yes, we stand under this present grace, but we push, we walk into obedience. We do the things that we know God and his word calls us to do. We know it to be his will. And so we do it. We obey his word. His word is a light to our feet. His word, we hide in our hearts that we might not sin against him. So while we stand under that waterfall of grace, not perfect, not sinless, just striving to be an example, we pursue obedience, denying ungodliness and unholiness, denying worldly lust and going strong after God in his word, obeying his word, and then putting your eyes on that promised glory. Look for that blessed hope. You stand in front of Jesus one day, and when you stand there, you have no secrets. He knows all there is to know about you inside and out. And you will give an account to God for how you have used all that he has entrusted to you. And I don't know about you, but I want... I want to be ready for that. I want to be ready for that. I just want to have been found faithful to have used all that God has given to me for his name's sake. And this is the great reward that when we do that in this present world, men see our good works and men glorify our Father which is in heaven. That all those who are of the contrary part have nothing that they can say about the good name of our God. All those who are of the contrary part have nothing they can say about the good name of our God. Oh, let's hold him up. Let's allow his name to get the honor. Let's allow his name to get the glory. And let's hold him high and lift it up so he can draw all men to himself. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for today. Father, we thank you for your word. Use it in our lives. And may we go strong after you in it. Father, remind us of your grace. Give us strength to pursue you in obedience and give us eyes to see eternal things. And may we live for you. May we live for the millions and millions of years that are to come. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Boy, don't you want that? Don't you want that kind of a life? Don't you want your life to count for the Lord? I'm convinced all across this room, we have students at West Coast that want their life to count for Jesus Christ. You want to get to the end of your race and say, I live for something more than just what the culture had to offer. I live for Jesus Christ. But you know what happens? We go back to the room, we look in the mirror, and we think, that ain't going to happen. I just don't have what it takes. I mean, if they only knew, if they only knew some of my background, if they knew some of my hurts, if they knew some of my flaws, yeah, it all sounds good, but I don't think, I don't think I can live that kind of life. I don't think my life can be productive for Jesus Christ.